purpose of this photographic program is to provide basic information about depth of field. Depth of field is the amount of sharpness from front to back and the amount is variable and governed by a number of factors and they are a small aperture will increase depth of field. A large aperture decreases depth of field. A wide angle lens increases depth of field at any aperture setting. And of course, a telephoto does the opposite. It decreases depth of field at any aperture setting. I would add to this that close-up or macro photography, then depth of field is dramatically decreased at any lens or aperture setting. So let's now show you a few photographs, which I hope will give a little bit more detail as to what depth of field is really all about and how it can be extremely creative in our photographic efforts. I take you now to a local beauty spot in the Surrey Hills, Happy Valley, not far from Colston in uh, Surrey. Now to maintain sharpness from front to back, from where Natasha, my very good friend, using an Olympus camera incidentally, she is sharp and so is the background. Now to ensure that both halves of the picture are absolutely sharp, I've used a small aperture, f11, f16 possibly, and a wide angle lens. So with that combination, then I'm increasing depth of field. Furthermore, I've employed what is known as the hyperfocal distance. That is, I focus about a third of the way into the picture because depth of field extends twice as much behind the subject as in front. So you don't want to focus on Natasha or indeed the background. Otherwise, half the picture could be slightly unsharp. So I manually focus in something like 50 feet into the picture to make sure of overall sharpness. Now I've done the same with Pevensey Castle down in East Sussex, so that the walls of the castle are sharp from front to back. And the same again applies to Reigate Hill. The view indicator is sharp as well as the background. Exactly the same technique as the shot with my good friend, of course, Natasha. Now, with this shot of a teasel, I've done exactly the opposite. So that it stands out from the background, which of course is unsharp, only the teasel is sharp. Then it's a combination of a large aperture, which reduces depth of field, remember, and a telephoto lens. I've also done similar exercise here, would you believe, in Catrum Cemetery with the wild garlic. I think that's what it is. And also, when you get further back, you've got to be careful even more so of the background because the further you come away from the subject, the depth of field is going to increase at any aperture or lens setting. So again, as I say, I've chosen the background carefully so that the blossom stands out from the background. The background does not interfere. And this, the, the answer to all of this, the technique is based on experience and trial and error. When you get in closer and sort of have a broad picture, then again, depth of field is reduced. Everything is sharp, but the amount of depth of field is avail available to me has been reduced. 
So again, I've employed the hyperfocal distance going into a third of the way into the picture. We can see this clearly in these next shots. When I'm further away, everything is sharp. Now the F number was 6.3. Getting in closer and keeping the lens setting the same, notice how everything becomes unsharp, except of course the nettle, which was the purpose of the uh, exercise. But you have to choose your aperture very carefully because in ensuring that the background is unsharp, then you don't want to use such a wide aperture or telephoto lens that you can't get sharpness over the nettle itself. You want the whole of the nettle to be sharp, yet the background to be unsharp. And that takes quite a skill in photography, which auto on cameras will never teach you. When photographing uh, close-ups like the bark of this tree, if everything is on the same plane, then depth of field is hardly going to matter. It's not like the bloom of, say, a rhododendron where you've got depth. Here, everything is more or less the same distance away. So once you photograph on part of the bark, then everything is going to be sharp. We have a kind of reverse situation if everything is a long way away. Uh, now, depth of field uh, becomes hardly relevant because after 200 feet or so, then you are in the realms of infinity and everything will be sharp. It doesn't matter where you focus, everything is going to be sharp, provided, of course, there's nothing in the foreground. And that is not the case with this sharp. So whatever I focus on, everything will be sharp. As a postscript to the foregoing, I'm using Micro Four Thirds and Olympus camera. Now, because the sensor is smaller, and therefore the focal length of lenses are shorter over the entire range from wide angle through to telephoto, then Micro Four Thirds will give you more depth of field than many other larger formats. This is particularly useful inside churches under low light. Even at F4, provided I take care of matters related to lenses and the hyperfocal distance, then I can achieve sharpness from front to back, from the kneelers in the foreground, right through to the back of the church. I would add that it is a mistake to assume that Micro Four Thirds cannot give you differential focusing, that is to throw the subject out from the background to make that unsharp. You have seen already that this is possible, provided, of course, you understand the technique of depth of field. As I've said earlier, Auto will not teach you this, but if you want to use the automatic uh, facilities on a camera, then having some understanding of what is going on in relationship to depth of field, then you're going to get a more accurate and refined photograph at the end. Thank you for watching this program. I hope it has been useful. I would regard understanding depth of field not only one of the most creative aspects of photography, but I'm afraid one of the most difficult to understand and to get to grips with.